more serious is that it's factually completely wrong. Uh, there's plenty of evidence, I won't mention it, for uh, movement that yields no overt uh, phenomenon associated with it. So it can't be right empirically. So it has two serious problems. Uh, and uh, uh, we ought to look for a different account. Actually, there is uh, a, a, a way of thinking about it that may, may be right that derives from one of the most interesting cases of movement that leaves no physical uh, evidence behind. That's uh, based, based on work by Howard Lasnik, mainly, a couple of others, on what uh, was used to be called raising the object. Uh, the has to do with sentences like, uh, I expect John to be intelligent, where John semantically is, this belongs in the clause John intelligent, but it's possible to show that it actually appears in the higher clause, which doesn't make, make any semantic sense. Uh, and it gets there by uh, a double movement operation, neither of which, which don't, doesn't leave any effect, namely the, sub, the downstairs subject, John, and I expected John to be intelligent. John moves over the verb, and then the verb moves up to the small v that heads the phase, and it leaves things looking exactly as they were. Well, that looked so crazy that for quite a few years I worked pretty hard uh, trying to find counter evidence or some alternative uh, uh, analysis, and you can see the residue of this in various papers, uh, but it didn't work. The evidence looks solid. Uh, so we're left with this extremely strange phenomenon. There's a whole variety of semantic and syntactic consequences to a movement that makes no, a double movement that makes no sense at all because it leaves things exactly the way they started from the point of view of what you hear. Uh, well, that remained as a paradox until it was noticed that uh, you could get a solution to this problem if you assumed that the properties of the head of the phase, C and V, small v, uh, were actually inherited by the element it selected. It would be tense and the verb in this case. Uh, I won't go through the, you know, the details, but if you assume that, then these two movements take place uh, and you get the array of syntactic and semantic properties uh, 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 on the, the assumption of inheritance of the feature. Uh, now, that, the inheritance itself was pretty weakly motivated. There was some motivation, but not much. Uh, however, it was pointed out by uh, Mark Richards that uh, the inheritance is actually entailed by the phase impenetrability condition, the condition on uh, transfer of the interior. And that itself is very well motivated conceptually and empirically. So in fact, I have a line of argument which goes from the empirical and computational motivation for the transfer operation, which yields as a consequence inheritance, which yields as a consequence this array of semantic and syntactic features, uh, properties uh, that seem to make no sense but are clearly there. Well, that's a good result, the kind of result you want. And if you make, make one more step, you generalize the inheritance of features to the question element, the Q that call it, that determines that something that a C is a question, not a declarative. If that too is inherited, then you get the vacuous movement hypothesis. Uh, you can think it through. I won't run through it, but uh, uh, in fact, it's true. Uh, so without stipulating a new principle, which is furthermore wrong, uh, you can get the vacuous movement hypothesis with all of its consequences, including the case I mentioned about uh, the so-called ECP case, uh, just on the basis of pure third, third factor properties. Well, again, that's the kind of result one wants. And I won't go on, but these are uh, the sorts of directions that I think uh, it would make sense to pursue, that is, chipping away as much as you can at uh, stipulated properties of universal grammar, technologies that are proposed to deal with particular problems, uh, try to see how closely you can show that language does approximate to the perfect design that uh, it would be a rather natural expectation uh, in the light of what appears to be its uh, 
evolutionary history. Okay, thanks. So we have time. For, we have time for just a couple questions. So uh, let me just. Yes, there's a microphone up there. Sequential and uh, one-dimensional. What are your remarks and reflections on parallel grammars and multiple-dimensional grammars such as area grammars? I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Did you hear? Carol. I, I believe the question is what. As I understand your question, is, well, it has to do with parallel grammars? Well, I mean, this is what I was describing is a parallel grammar. So when you do repeated construction of something by merge, it's all happening in parallel. Two dimensional? Yeah, I think there's good reason for thinking that, uh, uh, I didn't go into it, that uh, there, there is at least two dimensionality. Uh, this has to do with the nature of adjuncts as distinct from arguments. I think there's some evidence that they're actually in a third dimension. Uh, these are actually proposals that go back to ideas of Ken Sapphire and others back in the 80s, but I think you can get a better formulation of them, which would mean, if it's true, that there's actually two kinds of merge. Uh, one is just set merge, takes X and Y and forms the set XY, and the other, call it pair merge, uh, takes x and y and gives the pair x, y, where, which builds in an asymmetry, and adjuncts have an asymmetry. So the, ad, the, fr the adjunct phrase behaves like, as if the adjunct wasn't there, you know, it behaves like the thing to which it was adjoined to. And I think there's, you know, it's complicated, but I think there's some evidence for that. Uh, however, any further complication that's introduced has to have empirical motivation, okay? I mean, just, you know, elementary methodological considerations. You pick the simplest possible theory unless you're shown that it's wrong because the facts are more complex. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. We have to move on. Yes, Josh. So, can you comment on how this, the current guiding principle of perfection relates to the, the classical original idea of simplicity in the early days of general grammar? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, there... Yeah, the question, the, the question is, is, how does the, unless Josh wants to use it, how, how does the notion of, of simplicity in the early days of generative grammar relate to this notion of perfection or perfectibility in the uh, current sense? Yeah. Is that about it? Yeah. Well, if you go back to the early days, say the 50s, uh, there were two concepts of simplicity. One is just the general concept that holds for science altogether. And nobody can tell you what it is. Uh, but everyone working in the sciences uses it as a guiding principle. So you look for symmetries instead of asymmetries, and uh, you try to have fewer principles instead of more principles, and so on. And there's all kind of work on this, like Hermann Weyl's book on symmetry, and so on and so forth. But there's some kind of gui guiding principle that works in the sciences that's just accepted everywhere but never formulated that says uh, we're looking for the simplest possible solution. That's a general methodological principle. It's no more relevant to linguistics than to you know, physics or uh, you know, history or anything else. Uh, that's one notion. A second notion was an internal notion of simplicity. Uh, now, that's an empirical assumption. Remember that in those days, the assumption was that language acquisition is uh, sort of what Charles Sanders Peirce called abduction. It's discovery of a theory on the basis of data. Now, it's perfectly well understood and has been, you know, for hundreds of years that there's no way to do this, uh, that you can't do it by induction and there's no generalizations and nothing else. Uh, it has to be something like what Peirce described. Namely, there's got to be some built-in principles, we would now say genetically determined principles, that in his words limit available hypotheses. Okay, they just say, well, here's the only set of hypotheses you're allowed to look at. Uh, so it eliminates, you know, huge masses of others. And that can guide inquiry in a particular direction. Now, Peirce was thinking about the development of science. You know, how do people discover um, quantum theory or something? Uh, but the same conception has to hold for acquisition of language, 
if indeed language is a matter of theory construct, language acquisition is a matter of theory construction, which it was assumed to be. And it's in this context that the internal notion of simplicity developed. Uh, can, it was called an evaluation measure. Can we find some measure that we can assign to the possible grammars, internal languages, that'll pick the best one? So there has to be some sharp limitation, Persian type limitation on the set of admissible grammars, but then you've got to pick one. And inside that came the notion of simplicity, so that's where you get you know, notational devices like brackets and parentheses and you know, counting features and stuff like that. But notice that that's an empirical hypothesis. Okay, it says this is the way languages are picked. Okay, all that sort of went out the window when the principles and parameters approach was formulated back around 1980. This was a really sharp change in the way language was looked at. I mean, you know, maybe it's wrong, but it looks right. In any event, it changed things, perspectives radically. It said there is no evaluation procedure and there's no abductive principle and you're not discovered, the child isn't discovering a theory. Uh, there are principles which are fixed, unchanged, and if the SMT is correct, may in fact uh, 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 follow from general natural law to a large extent, but there are principles that are fixed, and then there's a set of choices called parameters, and the child just has to find the values for the parameters. Well, there's going to be finitely many of these, so there'll be finitely many languages, and uh, uh, most of the work on language acquisition since then has been studying very productively uh, what kind of data would allow a child to fix a parameter. And, you know, it turns out you can't do it one at a time, and a lot of complexities arise, and so on. Uh, but with that approach, you eliminate the notion of evaluation procedure. And what we're left with is just the general notion of simplicity. All right, how does that relate to uh, the present case? It's a sort of a, a way of trying to take the methodological principle of simplicity that's used for all inquiry and see if we can give it a instead of an epistemological interpretation, give it a metaphysical interpretation. Say, okay, this is a real property of nature. Okay, it's not just some methodological principle we use, but it's a property of nature that it, uh, uh, it, that it has, that it seeks computational efficiency. It's a natural law. If it is, it ought to show up in, uh, you know, uh, uh, distribution of, uh, you know, determining the, uh, neural wiring of a nematode, to pick one example where it seems to work. Uh, it should show up in foraging strategies for, uh, uh, you know, for ants, let's say, uh, and in all sorts of places. It should just be the way nature works. So it's a shift from a viewing something as an epistemological principle of some vague kind to a metaphysical principle, a metaphysical principle, if you like, something that's really true of nature which you can then explore in many different ways. So to take a concrete example, it's always been assumed in the actual study of language that uh, if you have redundancy in a system, there's probably something wrong. So for example, Morris Halley's uh, famous argument against phonemes back, uh, what is it, it is almost 50 years ago, I guess, was based on the structuralist phonemes, on the observation that uh, if you postulated this level, you had to duplicate rules, one in forming the level and one in mapping the level onto the next stage, and it was the same rules, so it was redundant. Well, just on epistemological grounds, that was taken, at least by sensible people like me, <laughs> as a proof that the uh, level doesn't exist. But you could reinterpret that as saying, that's just not the way nature works. You know, the way nature works is SMT uh, and uh, optimal, you know, neural wiring and so on and so forth. So it's a, and if you take it that way, it shifts from a methodological principle to an empirical principle that you can investigate. Like you could say, well, does nature really work this way? Let's try other cases, you know. And, and that's a step forward. But that's the relation. Uh, SMT is, an, is uh, an empirical hypothesis about the way nature works.